Right from the start, I'm going to assume that I'm speaking to Christadelphians. And by that I mean Bible students. People who know their way around their Bible, people who know how to look up a concordance and understand how to use that concordance, um, people who know uh, the basic elements of interpretation, uh, the use of context and metaphors and possibility versus probability and logic and, uh, and all those sorts of things. Because you see, Christadelphians, after all, are Bible students. <clears throat> Therefore, the overheads we're going to have this afternoon will not be any Bible quotes. We're going to turn them all up and see for ourselves what these things say. So, <clears throat> when we come to the subject in hand... I won't be laying any foundations. I will simply launch into it and ask you to join me on that ride as we start asking questions about what we are going to read. And you'll see what I mean as we go. So the subject matter on hand to, to this afternoon is a more sure word of prophecy. The quote comes from 2 Peter chapter 1. So let's go there first. And because you're Christadelphians, you're going to have no trouble finding 2 Peter chapter 1. And here we will find our title for today. <clears throat> so 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Now, you're Christadelphians, so what's the context here in verse 19? Well, Peter's just recounted what he saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, verse 18. And just before that, when we were with him in the Holy Mount, he says in verse 18, and just before that in verse 16 and 17, they confirm the fact that that is the subject matter in which we are talking. So that's the context, the transfiguration. The theme, of course, might be another matter, and we'll talk about that later. The context is what Peter, James and John saw when they went up into the Mount of Transfiguration and what they heard. Now, let's briefly run over that again. It's just a Sunday school lesson, and um, so let's do that briefly. Jesus took with him Peter, James and John up into a high mountain, apart by themselves, leaving the other nine disciples way down there at the bottom of the mountain to deal with the multitude and the epileptic boy. At some point on the way up that mountain, Jesus stopped and prayed. And as he prayed, he was transfigured before them. His raiment was white and glistering. His countenance was changed. And there appeared with him Moses and Elijah, and they were talking as though they had known each other forever. And these three disciples are watching this and they're mesmerised. They're watching this unbelievable sight. And then Moses and Elijah begin to leave. And Peter, the person who's writing Second Peter chapter 1, Peter blurts out whatever he thought would be appropriate that might keep Moses and Elijah there. And then this thick cloud descends upon them, like the cloud we had this morning, descended upon them, and a divine voice said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, unlike Moses and Elijah, hear ye him. You don't need anyone else. Listen to him. And the three disciples were petrified. They fell on their face for fear. Now, 30 years later, Peter still hasn't forgotten that. It was permanently etched in his memory. It's impossible to see something like that and then just forget it. So Peter here in the second epistle, chapter 1, verse 19, is presenting before us this unforgettable event 
And he says, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now, look, you're, you're a Bible student. What's so unusual about what Peter has just said? We have also, in addition to the vision I've just told you about, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. You see, it's more sure. And if Peter could not forget what he saw 30 years ago in that vision, what could be more sure than that? It's lasted 30 years. Well, prophecy. Can I give you very quickly, the, to, to, to those who might be contentious Bible students and, and want to tell me that the word more here in verse 19 is not in the original. All I say to you is, go and have, I, I agree with you, but go and have a look at the word sure. Because in the Greek, the word sure is not your normal word for the word sure. It means more than just sure. So the translation is correct. Now, what can be more sure than this unforgettable vision in the Holy Mount? Well, Peter says, a word of prophecy is more sure. Now, you're a bold prophecy, so I'm sure that your mind has already shot ahead and said, well, I wonder why it is. it says a word of prophecy. It, it, it could have said a word of doctrine or a word of commandment or a word of history or a word of wisdom or knowledge or virtue or any other thing, but it doesn't, it says, a more sure word of prophecy. Well, you've probably already noticed that prophecy keeps cropping up here. Look again at verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture. And verse 21, for the prophecy came not in old time. You see, prophecy is the subject. It's the theme. But why? Well, look at verse 15. Moreover, I will endeavour that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. So you see, Peter believes that his days are numbered. He will shortly die and eventually be forgotten. And so he wants to leave behind a legacy, some, something more abiding, something more sure. And the only thing he can leave them was the scriptures. But not just the scriptures, the prophecies of the scriptures. See, the scriptures were not enough. In his day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had the scriptures, but it didn't do them any good, did it? They were right off track. They even slew the Messiah. How could they do that when they had the scriptures in their possession? I'll tell you how. Because they didn't know the prophecies which spake about him, even though they had those scriptures in their hands. And look, brothers and sisters and young people, it's no different today. Every other religious organisation have got the scriptures. They all have their own understanding of those scriptures. And some of them will be stupid enough in days not far hence to stand up and oppose Messiah when he appears. How could they do that? Because they don't know the prophecies which speak of him, even though they have those scriptures in their hands. And, you know, sometimes there are some Christadelphians who do say, well, you know, our forefathers, our Christadelphian forefathers, well, they sometimes got the prophecies wrong too. Yes, sometimes. But I tell you, they would never, ever get it so wrong as to oppose Messiah when he appears. They would never. So let me say this. That the prophecies... The prophecies that some of our forefathers got wrong were minor. And brothers and sisters, they're not an excuse to stop looking at prophecy for yourself. It's better to have looked at it and got it a little bit wrong than to have never looked at it at all. All right, let's come back on track then. The Apostle Peter's dying. And his dying wish was that Christ's brethren should have the prophecies 
of the scriptures as a more sure foundation. To him, those prophecies were more sure and more important than seeing a vision of Jesus Christ in the transfiguration in glory. Have you got that? I want you to lock that in your mind. For Peter, prophecies were more important than a vision of glory. So that's Peter's last word. Look at prophecy for a sure foundation. What do you think Jesus Christ's last words were going to be? Revelation. Let's have a look at the book of Revelation. This is the words of our Lord. And, of course, he's immortalised when these words come in AD 96. And he knows that things are going to fall silent for 2,000 years before his return. And he wants to pass on his last words to his disciples in every generation. What do you think his last wish is going to be? You usually find this out, don't you? When somebody dies, you find out what their last wish was. Okay, well, here's Revelation chapter 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So John's bearing record. Firstly, of the words, and then secondly, the things that he saw. Now, isn't that similar to what Peter said? But the words were more important. Now, notice, verse 2. John bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, this is his last will and testimony, so to speak. These are his last words. They're called the testimony of Jesus Christ. Okay, now come over to chapter 19 and keep remembering this term, the testimony of Jesus Christ. We come to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 10. And I fell at his feet to worship him, and he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelations is the testimony of Jesus. And did you know that the Greek word for prophecy is used most prolifically in the book of Revelations, more than any other New Testament book. And back in Hebrews, in the Old Testament, it's most prolifically in the book of Jeremiah. So this prophecy, what is, what is prophecy? You know, if you look at both the Greek and the Hebrew words, they both mean, quite simply, prediction. However, we uh, need to know uh, what these predictions are. What is a prophecy? And to do that, I want to draw a comparison between a, a prophecy and a doctrine, just to make it clear. Because sometimes prophecies and doctrine overlap each other. So let me give you an example. We believe that Jesus Christ will return to the earth. Is that a doctrine or a prophecy? It's both. The Bible predicts that Jesus Christ will return. So it's a prophecy. But that, pro that prediction is also a tenet of our faith, and so it's a doctrine. All right, what about the unity of God? God is one. Prophecy or doctrine? Doctrine. It's only doctrine. So if you were to put up prophecy and doctrine, the question would be, which one is more important, doctrine or prophecy? Let's use the term here in Revelation chapter 19. Look at it again in regard to prophecy. It says the spirit 
of prophecy. He calls it the spirit of prophecy. What's the spirit? The spirit's the power, the motivation, the energy, the drive. So prophecy has a form of power, a spirit. Now here's the test. Here is how we prove it. If I was to take you back in history 600 years ago, take you back into the middle of Europe, the true believers back then believed and they taught the doctrine of the unity of the Godhead, just as we do. But the church authority back in those days, the Roman Catholic Church, seized them for preaching this heresy. And their punishment was to be burnt at the stake. However, if they recanted this doctrine, they would be spared. And a certain percentage did recant. Disappointing, but a fact. They recanted their doctrine. Why? Well, more importantly, why did all the others not recant their doctrine? That's the real question. Do you think that they refused to recant their, their doctrine solely because the doctrine was correct? Was it the, the power of the doctrine that allowed them to face the flames of death? No. No. They faced the flames of death, fully convinced that Jesus Christ would return to the earth, a prophecy, and he would raise the dead in Christ, a prophecy, and grant eternal life to his faithful followers, another prophecy. The spirit of prophecy so convinced them powerfully that they acted bravely in the face of death. That's the power of prophecy. Mind you, doctrine is important, but prophecy has power. Prophecy can produce faith and hope. I'll put it to you that doctrine cannot do that. So when we come back here then to uh, Revelations 19, uh, we have John saying the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of the power, the vital essence of prophecy. And he doesn't just say it once. You come over here now, just a few pages, to Revelation chapter 22, the very last chapter of the Bible. Jesus Christ's last chance to make his point to his disciples. And he says in verse 6, he says, this is what's important. He said unto me, these sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets... Send his angel to show unto his servant the things which must shortly come to pass. pass. And you go to verse 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. You come to verse 10. And he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. You come to verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. And the verse 19, And if any man shall, shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. Look, brethren, sisters and young people, what's he emphasising? I mean, you'd have to have a, a, a single digit IQ to, to miss the emphasis here, surely. He's saying, look at the prophecy of this book. That's the emphasis. Now look, why am I being so blunt about all this? Well, I want you to come back now to Second Peter, chapter 3. And this, of course, is Peter's last chance now because he's not in Second Peter chapter 1 now. He's in the very last chapter of his book, the last chapter he will ever write. This is his last chance. And, you know, I find this prophecy remarkable because what we're about to read now is the only prophecy in the Bible that is about prophecy itself. You'll see. OK, Second Peter, chapter three and verse one. 
This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that ye may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of, of the Lord and Saviour, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. These scoffers, brethren, sisters and young people, are saying, where's the promise of his coming? He promised to come and he hasn't come. So much for this prophecy that he gave us. To them, prophecy now meant very little. Not important. Didn't come to pass. So you can relegate prophecy right down to the bottom of the list. Even with mythical uh, folklore, perhaps. It'll never happen. That was their attitude. But Peter is prophesying that prophecy would therefore be downgraded to a laughable <coughs> insignificance. And sure enough, about 10 years after this, AD 68 to 70, happened. And all these fringe-dwelling scoffers were saying, where is he? He promised that he would return. And look at the dilemma we're in. It's not happening. Where's the promise of his coming? We cannot wait any longer. And they eventually dismissed the value of prophecy altogether and they were overcome. And you know what, brothers and sisters? I can understand that. I mean, they had the Roman army smashing their walls, killing their loved ones, destroying all their possessions, causing mayhem and uncertainty, and they were distressed and they were perplexed and, and they were in fear of their life. And I can understand their lack of faith under those circumstances, as wrong as it was. Now, now I want to take you back to 2 Kings chapter 6, which we read. And of course, when you come to 2 Kings chapter 6, we're going back 800 years before Peter ever wrote. And of course, things were very different then. They still had a king sitting upon a throne in Israel, in Samaria. But have a look at their circumstances here. Second Kings chapter 6 and verse 24. Came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. So you get this scene in your mind. They're inside a stoned wall city. Now look, you people in Melbourne know what a lockdown's like. They were in lockdown. And the reason they were in lockdown is because the Syrians had invaded their country and they'd gone and ransacked all the villages around and of course, you're probably one of them that have, that have fled one of those villages and come into Samaria or into a fortified city for safety. And the Syrians are all now outside the wall salivating for blood. And inside the wall, a famine's taken hold. The food's running out. People are starving and emaciated. You can see the hunger in their eyes. They start doing unthinkable things just to eat and live. They're even eating their own little babies, we're told in verse 26 to 29. And they're paying 80 pieces of silver for a dead donkey's head. And you know what's so ridiculous about that? Joseph was sold into Egypt for 30 pieces of silver. But these people are so desperate I'll pay 80 pieces of silver for a donkey's head. You know what, brothers and sisters? 
you might think lockdowns in Melbourne were bad. But this scene here was particularly ugly. It's a little hard to imagine, but it happened. And the king of, the, the king of Samaria is in desperation. Look what he does in verse 30. 2 Kings 6 verse 30, And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes and he passed by upon the wall and the people looked and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Then he said, God do so and more also to me if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him, him this day. Now, brethren and sisters, when I read that, I was sitting in my comfortable chair, in my well-furnished study, in my modern four-bedroom brick home, on my peaceful six-acre block, and I'm saying, what on earth is this dingbat king thinking? Elisha. Elisha had nothing to do with this famine. He wasn't like Elijah who just strode into the king and, and said, there will be no dew nor rain these years except at my word. That wasn't Elijah. So why is he blaming Elijah? What a fool of a king. He must be nuts. I'll tell you what, brothers and sisters, he was crazy. Hunger can make you really, really crazy. And so this king sends a message to take off Elisha's head. Meanwhile, Elisha is sitting in his house in Samaria, unflustered. And about him are the elders all sitting there with him, unperturbed. And the messenger arrives and look what he says. This is the, the words of the messenger. 2 Kings 6 and verse 33, And while he yet talked with them, behold, the messenger came down unto him and he said, Behold, this evil is of Yahweh. What should I wait for Yahweh any longer? God did this. Why should I hope in God any longer? I've had enough of waiting for God to do anything. Where's the promise of his coming? You see the man's frustration and his lack of faith. And then the king bowls in. And Elisha utters a prophecy. Chapter 7, verse 1. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of Yahweh. Thus saith Yahweh, Tomorrow. About this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. 24 hours from now and you will have normal trade at normal prices in your gate. That's the prophecy. What you have just paid for a dead donkey's head will tomorrow buy you 80 measures of of fine flour, not coarse flour, fine flour. Wow, what a change of circumstances. No, that wasn't the reaction. Actually, here's the re reaction in verse 2. Then a lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if Yahweh would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. This was the reaction of the man upon whom the king leaned. This was another prophecy to him. Prophecy to the man who ridiculed the first prophecy. Now, I'm relying on you being Bible students and knowing this story. Within 24 hours, both prophecies were fulfilled. Normal trade re re resumed and the unbelieving servant saw it from the gate but was trampled in the stampede and he died of his injuries. But you know what, brothers and sisters and young people? I can understand this man. I mean, under the circumstances that were prevailing, desperation had set in. They were trapped. They were under lockdown. You know what that's like. They were under lockdown. They didn't have any food. Women were boiling up their little babies and eating them. And I can understand this messenger saying, this has gone on too long. I'm not waiting around for Yahweh any longer. 
that, of course, was no different to Peter's prophecy, where's the promise of his coming? And in their minds, they had gone beyond the point of no return. It was too late. All hope was lost. And so when Elisha prophesied that there would be an abundance of food in 24 hours' time, the king's right-hand man had it summed up. What? You think God is going to open the windows of heaven right above us now and drop down rain? And what good would that be? Inside a stone-walled city, an abundance of rain would do nothing. It takes three months to get a crop after there's some rain. There's no way that that could happen in 24 hours' time. And look, I can understand his perception under the duress of that time. And he was crazy with hunger. But this man was wrong. But I understand his mistake. But let me tell you what I do not understand. Actually, we need to come back to 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's do that as we draw some parallels here. You see, primarily, 2 Peter chapter 3 is the prediction of AD 70, primarily. But if you think it was solely applied to AD 70, you are misled. You see, here's a simple rule of thumb for it. Revelations was written in AD 96, some 26 years after the, after um, after uh, AD 70. And when it was finally written, there was an opportunity then for the Spirit to turn around and to remove 2 Peter chapter 3 out of the record altogether if it no longer applied to the future. But the Spirit chose to leave it in here because... It does have relation to our days. And here we are in the future today. Look at Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom, wisdom given unto him, hath written unto us, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Now, I just heard an echo. The servant of the king in 2 Kings chapter 7 didn't believe the prophecy of Elijah unto his own destruction. The people of Peter's day, the Jews, didn't believe the prophecy of Messiah unto their own destruction. AD 70. And now Peter is saying, you people of the future, you Bible students in 2022, there are prophecies which are hard to be understood. And if you're not a Bible student, unlearned, you will become unstable and you'll twist things unto your own destruction. And you know what I don't understand, brothers and sisters? That's already happening. And there's no invading army. There's no famine. There's no baying for our blood. Our possessions and our loved ones are all safe. There's no mothers eating little babies. The economy and trade is doing fine under the circumstances. And yet people are saying, why should I wait for Yahweh any longer? And they leave. Why? I'll tell you why. Because they took their eyes off prophecy. They stopped looking at prophecy. You know, what you look at is where you end up. Now, that's a fact of life. Let me give you an example. There's been many occasions of this, but there's this one example many years ago. 
I was doing a youth um, group talk down in Brisbane and it's two and a half hour drive from Brisbane to my place. And after the youth group talk, one of the young ladies there was actually from up our way. She was on her learner's permit. So she said, can I drive home so I can get two and a half hours up on, on the clock? I said, yeah, okay. So she hopped in my car and off we went through the northern parts of Brisbane and we're, we're about, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes out of Brisbane. She's now learnt how my car works and where the left-hand wheel is on the thing and, and we're driving away nicely. And we come through this little town and the road veers slightly to the right. And as she's driving along, she looks ahead and there's a police car coming and she says, oh, look at the police car. And she went where her eyes went. Fortunately, I'd seen that happen many a time and I grabbed the steering wheel and pulled it back and we didn't die up a tree somewhere. But that's a fact of life. Wherever your eyes are going is where you will go. I mean, how many times have you seen what do they call the funny home video things where some, somebody's walking along uh, the street and they get distracted and bang, they run into a power pole. That's a fact of life. Where you are looking is where you will end up. Simple. Now, look at Peter's dying words now. Getting right to the end of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. <clears throat> he says this. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Look, look, looking. And, and what are they looking at? Verse 12, they're looking at the coming of the day of God, a prophecy. Verse 13, they look for a new heaven and new earth, a prophecy. And therefore, Bible students, keep your eyes on prophecy. And that's where you'll end up, in the new heavens and the new earth. And yet brethren and sisters are leaving the truth because they've got their eyes on other things. And look, can I add... A passionate plea. I know some very solid brethren in the truth, some very intelligent brethren in the truth, and they're spending too much time on internet sites of conspiracy theorists. And guess what they're becoming? Conspiracy theorists. And I plead to them, stop looking at those sites. Heed the words of 2 Peter chapter 3. Look for better things. Look, there is so many prophecies in the Bible which have not had their depths delved into, which you could be looking at instead, particularly in Jeremiah and Isaiah. Take that up instead and look at that because you'll end up in a better place. And Bible prophecy is more sure than conspiracy theories. Because Bible prophecy will happen. It's definite. All the other things that you can look at in these days, they're not sure. They'll fade. They'll morph. They'll disappear. Or they just won't even eventuate. Brothers and sisters and young people, what more can I say other than to paraphrase what the Apostle Peter said, Bible prophecy is a more sure word.